Christ. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Romans, chapter number 12. Romans, chapter number 12. I started to say, I want to speak to you this morning on a serious subject. But I do that every week. Every time I preach, it's from the Bible, and that makes it serious. So let me... uh, let me rephrase that this morning. I want to speak to you today about one of the biggest problems that we face. When I say we, I don't just mean the folks here at Lakeway. I'm talking about uh, people in general. And, and yet, as big as the problem is, it seems to me that very little is being said about it. And the problem I'm talking about is, is a fight that few people ever really win. It's a problem that most people never solve. Most people would rather just sweep it under the rug than to admit to it. And, uh, you know, for some, the problem goes all of the way back to their childhood, and they've lived all of these years, and and there's not a a day goes by but but what they've been tortured by this problem. It's as though they're imprisoned by it, They're enslaved to it. They can't get out. They can't break free. It's it's like a stalker that is always there or a dark cloud that never goes away or a nightmare that never ends. It's a destructive force that divides families and churches and destroys the strongest of men. Now, every time I preach, I hope and I pray that I have your attention, but that's really especially true today because you need to hear what I'm about to say, and I need to hear it also. It's a message we all need. The title of the message is Battling Bitterness. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 19. We're going to look at three sections of Scripture this morning. Romans 12 verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Boy, I wish I had learned that in the first grade. Avenge not yourselves. Bev can tell you the number of times, you know, that I've... uh, said things that, you know, I would have, back as an unsaved cowboy back in the early days, I'd have been one of those vigilantes because there's just something in me that felt like it was my duty to, you know, to make sure everybody had to pay for, you know, for what they did wrong. Well, that can get you hurt. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Now turn to Ephesians chapter number 4. I wish I had time to read this entire chapter, but I don't. And so we're going to just read verse 31 and verse number 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Hebrews, chapter number 12. Two verses. Verse number 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Regardless of where you're from, we all know some of the same people. Although they go by different names, they're, they're really the same in one sense. You could call 
You could call them maybe sire saints, caustic Christians or bitter believers. And, and, and you're liable to meet them anywhere, even in church. And the fact is, I think eventually all of us find ourselves in a battle against bitterness. One writer said, of all human emotion, bitterness ought to be feared the most. Now, he might be right. I'm not sure, but that was his opinion of it. Because of all of the battles, you know, that we wage, sometimes this seems to be the most difficult of all. And I could stand here and tell stories and read stories of different people that have experienced bitterness. They've been beaten and battered by bitterness for years. And many of you could stand and testify as to how bitterness has troubled your heart and made you miserable. In fact, some of you probably are battling bitterness even as I speak. You might not think of it as such, but yet deep within your heart, if you really knew your heart as God does, you would understand that the problem, the root of the problem that you're going through is due to bitterness that is in your heart. Now, I had a tough time preparing this message for three reasons. Number one... Most people don't want to deal with it. They really don't. You know, they'd much rather hear a sermon about heaven or much, some would rather hear a sermon about hell, I guess, than they would about this, because this gets right down to where we live. And it's difficult whenever we realize that we're speaking on a subject that a lot of people don't want to hear anything about. Second, Secondly, the problem is Satan doesn't want us to conquer it. And you mark it down, and every preacher knows this, he'll, he'll fight you every way possible trying to get you to not preach what you ought to preach. And then there's another reason, and that is that there's so much that could be said about this. And, and it makes it difficult. You know, sometimes... Whenever I was a young preacher, I just happened this morning, I lost so much stuff in the flood, but I happened to be looking through some papers this morning, and lo and behold, I found the handwritten notes, if, if you can believe this, of the first sermon I ever preached. I found them over there, I really did. And But it just reminded me that when you start out preaching, it's like, oh Lord, what? What am, what am, what am I going to say? How, you know, a ten minutes seems like an eternity when you start. But after you've been preaching a while and after you've studied a lot, after a while it's like, Lord, where do I cut this off? You know, because there's so much that could be said about it. And, uh, so this morning I just pray God will give me wisdom as we deal with this subject and that you know, I'll say what needs to be said and leave out what doesn't. But first of all, we need to consider the seriousness of this matter. And I say it's a serious subject because bitterness does terrible things to people. It affects us in a lot of ways. It affects our actions. It shows in our face. It reveals itself sometimes even in the tone of our voice. And like Adrian Rogers said, he said, bitterness blows out the candle of joy and leaves the soul in darkness. And you can mark it down. There are a lot of folks that go to bed every night with bitterness in their heart. They wake up with it in the morning. They're tormented by it throughout the day. And, and they're sorely affected by bitterness in their heart. As I said a while ago, it's like a nightmare that never ends. It just goes on and on and on, replaying itself over and over and over. It does terrible things to people. But listen, it also is serious because it affects those that we come into contact with. It doesn't just affect you. When you get bitter, you mark it down. It's going to affect someone else. And that's a reflection on you because as a Christian, that makes us repulsive to others. The fact is, you know, none of us like to be around people who are like us when we're bitter. You know, we don't want to be around bitter people. We might be bitter, but we don't like to be around people that are bitter. The point is that we end up torturing ourselves with our bitterness. We make ourselves miserable. 
So look, it's a serious subject. It's serious. You know, a while ago I was thinking as we were singing and we think about singing to the Lord and worshiping the Lord and, and the quote from Adrian Rogers about, you know, bitterness just blowing the candle of joy out. Well, there's something happening in our Baptist churches today because, you know, it, like old Vans Hafner used to say, he said, I've seen more cheerful faces on an iodine bottle than I have in most churches. For you kids, that's a skull in the crossbones, by the way. But there's something wrong when we lose our joy. And Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Without joy, we are weak Christians. That makes us susceptible to temptation and a multitude of other sins. But what, what is the source of this bitterness? Well, it can happen for a lot of different reasons. Pastor Joe Stoll said many years ago he had asked a counselor. And this counselor is a man that was a seasoned counselor that had a lot of experiences in dealing with people. And so he asked him what the major issue was that brought people to him for counseling. And here's what he said. He said, the root of, the, uh, the root of many problems is broken expectations, if not dealt with, they mature into anger and bitterness. And he's right. Broken expectations. You know, a lot of times we have unrealistic expectations in life, and that gets us in trouble. It gets us in trouble in the sense that we think that God ought to be obligated to keep us pain-free, trouble-free, when, when the fact of the matter is God's not obligated to do that because we are vile sinners, undeserving of, of anything, of even the least of His favor. But our unrealistic expectations builds us up and we become proud and we love ourselves and esteem ourselves to the point that we feel that an injustice has been done to us because God let these things happen to us. But listen, there are certain expectations that we embrace rightly so. They're things we expect out of people. A young couple stands at the marriage altar and there they pledge their vows one to another to be faithful unto death and they have a right to have those expectations. When those expectations, whatever they are, are broken, all of a sudden, if something's not done, bitterness comes into the picture. It happens whenever something happens to us that we think that we don't deserve. It can be produced by presumption. A lot of times we just presume something, you know, and we get bitter about it, and it's not even so. We just presume that it was. Well, I just don't think he likes me. Well, maybe he's got an upset stomach, you know. There could be a lot of different reasons, you know, that makes it appear that somebody you know, is avoiding you, but in reality it might not be that at all. But you're, you're letting yourself get bitter because of that. So it can be presumptions, it can be problems, difficulties in our life that make us bitter. It can be people that make us bitter. And it can happen because of something that is said about us, something that is done to us, or something that is taken from us. And so these are the things that produce bitterness in our life. And it's important that we understand and that we recognize these things because they're like, you know, danger, warning signs to us. That we know when something like that happens, somebody violates your trust or somebody mistreats you in some way, you know that you're going to have a battle against bitterness. And so that brings us down to the struggle itself. And let me tell you, this is not a simple problem. One of the things that makes it difficult is that, is that we feel justified in feeling the way we do. We get bitter, but it's kind of like, you know, we think, well, yeah, I know I'm bitter, but I have a right to get bitter. And usually along with that, we also entertain the idea, not only do I have a right to get bitter, but I've got a right to show it. 
some people are, you know, really good at getting bitter and nobody knows it. They're able to kind of hide it. But most of us, when we get bitter, boy, we show it. And we have the, the attitude that, and nobody has a right to blame me. But let me tell you, blaming your bitterness on bad things doesn't help. It just makes things worse. When you, when you get bitter, you torture yourself and you, you, in other words, you allow the people that hurt you to keep on hurting you. And you're the only one that's able to stop that and you should. It's not a problem that you can ignore. Think about this. Nobody, nobody can make us bitter or better. Now, they might be contributing factors in the equation, but they can't make us bitter. They can't make us better. We do it to ourselves. No one can take away our joy. We have to surrender it. Nobody can make you happy. That's a choice that you make. So in this struggle, we incur a responsibility to deal with this issue. Notice what he said in Ephesians 4.31 here, the command, he says, get rid of all bitterness. And notice that little word, all, it's important. Because if just a little root is left, it'll grow back into a major problem. Just off of our patio in a little area right next to the garage, every year there, I have no idea what kind of a vine it is. We had a Torellus up there and it, and, and that thing every year would grow and cover that and wrap itself around the poles and everything else. And so we decided, Bev decided she didn't want that there. We tore the trellis down. We had the flood, had like five feet of water out there over that area. I mean, we've done everything imaginable and, and all of a sudden, lo and behold, I looked in the other day, hear that thing coming up through the ground. The root was still down in the soil, and it's working its way out. That's why it's important to get rid of all bitterness, because that little bitty root there is going to develop into a major problem. And if it's unresolved, bitterness will literally destroy you. It will result eventually in a life of regret. So what do we do? We're in this struggle and sometimes it seems impossible for us to get the victory over it. Well, I look in the Bible and a lot of times I can be greatly encouraged by just taking note of what some of these great saints went through. So sometimes that helps me. You know, I'll get to feeling sorry for myself maybe, and then I'll get to thinking about Jeremiah. Think about what he went through. Or I'll think about the Apostle Paul and what, and what he had to suffer. And, you know, I'll come back to reality and realize I don't have anything to complain about. Just look at the price they paid. Sometimes, you know, sometimes that can really help. So, you know, sometimes it helps whenever we take into consideration uh, the background of the person that hurt us or what they've been through. You know, nature makes us one thing. Nurture tends to make us something else sometimes. And there are people that have been brought up in homes to where they have not had the privilege, like some of you, of being raised in a godly environment. They've been, they've been raised, they've been abused, they've been mistreated, they've been neglected horribly. And it affects them for years to come. Sometimes it helps when you go to get bitter at someone for you to stop and think about what they've just been through. And by the way, we all act out of character once in a while, don't we? Sure we do. Somebody cuts you out, off out on the highway, you know, and all of a sudden, you're angry, more angry than you normally are, and uh, you're, sometimes you're just enraged. And so there's things that happen that cause us to act out of character. So we all let ourselves get out of balance that way. 
think about that. The next time you go to get getting bitter at someone, you know, if you had any idea what they might have been through or what they're going through, it'll help you to get over it. But I've got to tell you, folks, sometimes it seems like there's absolutely nothing that will help. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> get all bitter and been out of shape and so you open the Bible and you begin to read about Jeremiah and Paul and these others and you think to yourself, well, you know, I ought not to feel sorry for myself, but I do. Or maybe you try to think through the situation that somebody has, you know, that what they've been through and and your pride says to you, yeah, but I still wouldn't have done anything like that. Here's what you need to remember. If the Bible tells us to get rid of all bitterness, it means that it's possible. It's possible. God's not commanding you to do something that you can't do if, that's a big if, if you do what the Bible tells you to do. We can't defeat sin if we refuse to do as the Bible commands. It's impossible. Somebody says, well, you know, the Bible promised this and the Bible promised that. Yeah, and usually there's some conditions attached to that. So when God says get rid of all anger and bitterness and wrath and all of those things that create divisions and strife, when He says get rid of that, it means that we can and if we... If for some reason we're not, it's because we've got a problem in our relationship with the Lord. Now I said, look, this struggle is not something that's easy. If you if you knew, if you knew what some people seated right here today have been through, maybe back in their childhood. And I, I don't want to get too graphic, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, dredge up a bunch of old memories for some of you. But and I don't think I need to do that. But I'm telling you, there are people here today that have been treated horribly when they were little kids, abused in the very worst imaginable ways, and it's a struggle for them to to get over that bitterness. They've been living with it all of their life since they were a little child. They've been living with that bitterness. They've never let go of it. They've never won the battle over it. And that's why I'm telling you, because God commands you to do it, there's hope. You can. It's possible. You don't have to live in the bondage of bitterness any longer. So so what's the solution then? Well, you know, we can we can put it in some cute little phrase like, well, what we need is an attitude adjustment. Well, sure we do. You know, that demands action on our part. But if we're going to beat bitterness, we have to have, as Paul put it in Philippians chapter number 2, we have to have the mind of Christ. There has to be a change here in our mind. Well, you say, well, okay, how do I do that? I'm glad you asked. Look there in Hebrews 12, just the very beginning of the chapter. He gives you the answer. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And here's the, here's the bottom line, the key to it all looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now notice this, for consider Him. Wow. I mean, there it is. If I'm going to have the mind of Christ, I must be looking to Christ. Focused on Him, as one pastor said, the more I remember God's lavish, unwavering, inexhaustible love for us in Jesus, the more I forget to be irritated with others. 
The next time you're tempted to get mad and bitter towards somebody else, you need to just stop and think about how good God has been to you. Because we sure, we sure don't deserve it. We don't deserve those blessings. You have no idea this week how I've thought about this message and prayed that, that God please use it to help someone. Because I know there are people that are tortured by this bitterness. I can remember a time where, you, you know, as vengeful as I was, I, I really thought, okay, God has enabled me to get a handle on this. I, you know, I, I'm no longer a bitter person. And you know, sometimes we get bitter about things in areas that are the most unexpected. I've got to be so careful how I say this. I think the biggest battle in bitterness I've had to face had to do with one or more of my children. I never thought I'd get bitter at my kids. I, hey, I've sat down with my kids and said, look, I don't approve of what you're doing, but I want you to know I love you unconditionally and you'll never be able to do anything that will cause me to stop loving you. I've told them that. And yet at the same time, I had bitterness and resentment in my heart. How dare you shame me and the family and the church and do what you did? So God had to do some work in my heart. You know, I can look back and look back at my own life and think, dear God, what did they do that was as bad as what you did? So easy for us to get bitter toward people. When in reality, we've done the same thing or worse. And yet God loved us while we were yet sinners and gave His Son on the cross. How dare we harbor bitterness in our heart when we have such a gracious God that's helped us through those hard places in life. I want you to remember three things. Number one, if we're going to, if we're going to get the victory over this, we need to recognize the problem of bitterness. We've got to get honest about it. As I said at the very beginning, you know, it's hard to deal with because a lot of people just want to sweep it under the rug. They want to pretend that it doesn't exist or they want to feel like, well, I'm justified in feeling the way I do. And no, you're not. You said, yeah, but somebody did something that was wrong to me. Yeah, they did. That doesn't mean you've got to get bitter because of it. We have to recognize the problem of bitterness, not so much in others, but in ourselves. It's easy for me to, it's easy for me to see the bitterness in you. Well, it's not so easy whenever I have to deal with it in my own heart. Then we have to recognize the power of bitterness. I said at the beginning, this, making it, this is really difficult because there's so many things that need to be said and could be said. In recognizing the power of bitterness, let me tell you, it, it, will, it will dominate you mentally. It will mess up your mind. It will depress you emotionally. You can have a million dollars and be the most miserable person on this earth because you're bitter at someone. Can debilitate you physically. If we only knew what a severe effect sin has upon us physically, we take medicine and vitamins and everything under the sun trying to be more healthy when in reality a lot of times the real root of the problem has to do with our spirituality. And bitterness will destroy you spiritually. I didn't say it'll cause you to lose your salvation. That's not what I said. It will destroy you spiritually. 
You see, Paul's great fear in this world was not to lose his salvation because he could say, I know in whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. But Paul was, was fearful of what? Of becoming a castaway. Not in the sense of losing his salvation, but in the sense of him entertaining sin in his life, whether you call it bitterness or discouragement or whatever kind of sin it was, and that God would put him on the shelf of do nothing. And God would have to say, can't use you anymore, buddy. That's what Paul feared. He didn't want to become a castaway. I'm telling you, bitterness will absolutely ruin you spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally. And then we need, we need to remove the poison of bitterness. Get rid of it. Notice he said in verse number 14, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Back in Ephesians 4.31, what does he tell us to do? He tells us, put away. That Greek word that's translated into the English, put away, means to lift up. It's a word that you would use if you're lifting an anchor up so you can move on. There's some things that we need to forget about. Some of you have anchored yourself over a stinking cesspool of bitterness and sin, and you've stayed anchored there year after year after year. And God says, put it away. Lift your anchor. Move on. And then in the very next verse, verse number 32, He tells us to what? He tells us to forgive. Practice a life of forgiveness. Well, I'll tell you, it's only by the grace of God that Bev and I have been married all of these many years now. But I'm telling you, it was God's grace that enabled her to be a forgiving person such as she was. And I'm so glad I can look back and, and know that there are those that have forgiven me of my sins. James Merritt so we may not be familiar with Brother Merritt. He was president, I think, of the Southern Baptist Convention for a while. He's over in, I think, Marietta, Georgia, or somewhere in that area. He said, of all the human emotions, the one that I personally and actually fear the most is bitterness. Bitterness is an emotional cancer that will eat you up from the inside out. It's a blight that will contaminate you, a burden that will crush you, and a blaze that will cook you in its own juice. Well, I think he said it well, don't you? Bitterness is something that we cannot afford to tolerate in our life. I don't want to, look, I don't want to see you live that way. I don't want to live that way. It's horrible. And pretending that it doesn't exist doesn't solve the problem because it shows in your face, the tone of your voice, and your attitude, and the things that you choose to do or not to do. Bitterness affects all of those things. I think the biggest struggle in preparing this message was trying to figure out, okay, what do I do after... After the message. You know, there's so much more that could be said, but there comes a point in time where, like the old preacher said years ago, he said, the mind can absorb only what the seed of the britches can endure. A lot of wisdom in that. You know, and sometimes we reach the point where just saying more and more and more, you, you know, it actually becomes a detriment to what we're trying to accomplish. And I hope I've got this right. When I've asked God to help me, how do I end this message? And I'm going to do it like this. Somehow, folks, we have to get 
we have to get beyond expecting someone else to do something to help us beat bitterness. We've got to get beyond that. It's our job to overcome bitterness. You say, oh yeah, but if they would just do what they ought to do. Yeah, but maybe, maybe they won't or maybe they can't. Boy, we could just spare ourselves a lot of problems if we, uh, if we just had enough self-discipline to say, look, this is my responsibility. I'm not going to blame my wife. I'm not going to blame my husband. I'm not going to blame my kids. The, the bitterness that's in my heart is my problem. And I've got to deal with it. Let me give you an illustration. The great theologian, Connor McGregor. So I need to explain. I shouldn't have said that because some of you are really confused now. For you who don't know, I thank Brother Kenneth and my son Tim for introducing me to Connor McGregor. I, even though I've never watched one of his fights, he's one of these, uh, what well, you call them, cage fighters or what? He's a bad to the bone dude. <laughs> Connor McGregor made a statement, though. He said, now listen to this, I don't feel bitterness. I don't feel anger towards anybody. Fighting is never emotional to me. Let me tell you, that's the difference between a winner and a loser. Because when you lose your temper, you lose control and you lose the fight. I didn't learn that till the seventh grade. And I had to learn it the hard way. We had a neighbor that was one year ahead of me. He was going to junior high. I was still in grade school there in York School. And boy, I'll tell you what, as I've said, we had fights on the schoolyard every day. And I was convinced and trying to convince everybody there that I was the toughest dude in York School. And, and, um, and some that would debate that. But we fought over it. So this smart aleck that lived just down the street from me, he tells some folks there at the junior high about me. So the first day that I go there, I don't even get in the schoolyard until some dude meets me and wants to put me to the test. I don't even know this guy. He wants to fight. I said, sure. Man, he just knocked the snot out of me. I started crying and swinging like a wild man and somebody else standing over there, another kid, and he was laughing and I looked at him and said, what are you laughing at? You want some of this? Yeah, he jumped in. He whipped me. I got whipped twice before I ever got to the schoolhouse. Well, thankfully, before the year was over, we had a coach by the name of Rex Fraley, the adult PE, and, and I'd never had any boxing at all so he put in in the class you know he put some boxing gloves on us and i mean made a little ring there and taught us to box well you can imagine when i started it was just get in there and just swing as fast and wild and furious as i could and i began to realize wait a minute these guys that are just cool and blocking punches and dodging those guys they're they're winning the fight. Now understand, I learned a lesson, but it's one thing to learn the lesson. It's another thing to put it into practice. Because all my life, I struggled with my temper. Man, when I played Little League Baseball, I, well, you wouldn't believe the stuff I've done. But let me tell you, when you lose your temper, when you lose control, you're going to lose the game or lose the battle when it comes to sin in your life. It's our responsibility to be accountable for our actions. And if you're bitter, don't you keep on blaming some. Oh, I know they did you wrong. Don't you spend the rest of your life blaming them and eating up with bitterness. I don't know what caused them to do what they did. It was horrible, awful, terrible, or whatever. But God has better things for you.
You don't have to live like that. Stop tormenting yourself. Pull your anchor up from that cesspool. Move on with your life. You see, I cannot change what has happened to me. I cannot control what others do to me. But I can control what happens within me. And when I control what happens within me, then that changes what happens with me. Well, you say, preacher, you made it sound pretty simple. That's the answer then. Just get things under control. Well, but how do you do that? And I'm through with this. The only way for us to get control is to give Christ control of our life. Some of you are being beaten and battered by bitterness because you refuse to totally yield your entire life to Christ. When Paul spoke about the fruit of the Spirit there in Galatians chapter number 5, you know what the last thing he mentioned in that list of nine things? Temperance, that's self-control. The best self-control is God's control. So when we put ourselves under His control and yield ourselves to Him without any reservations, realizing I have no reason to be bitter, nobody ever did anything worse to me than what I've done to God. And you better be careful if you decide you want to argue about that statement. I said, nobody's ever done anything worse to you than what you've done to God. You sinned against a holy God. Whatever they did to you, it wasn't to a holy person, a sinless person. And it's only as I yield myself to Him and say, Lord, I can't do this, but you can. And give Him control of my life. It's then that God enables me to take control of myself. And I don't have to live as a bitter person. And you don't either. And if you're here today and you don't have Christ in your life, you've never trusted Him as your Lord and Savior, please understand that until you do, until you do, you'll never get the victory over the sin that's in your life. Worse than that, you'll never, ever have any hope of being reconciled to God and a hope of heaven in your heart. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And that's true of all of us. But if you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can beat bitterness. You can defeat sin. You can win over the slavery of sin and the penalty of sin. You can have a hope that's steadfast and sure by trusting Him. God help us, each one, to deal with, with that root of bitterness that's in our heart and get rid of it before it tears us down and ruins our life. Let us pray. Father, How we thank You, Heavenly Father, for Your goodness toward us. And Lord, how we thank You for the fact that You've made provision for us to be victorious because there is victory in Jesus. You tell us that we're more than conquerors through Him that loved us and gave Himself for us. Yet there's so many times that we let things like bitterness Jealousy, envy, strife, we let all of these things creep into our life and take control of us. God, may this morning, may we give You control. Fill us with Your Spirit. Empower us to do Your will. And save the soul that's nearest hell. For we beg it in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Now while we stand and as we sing together, Would you do what God's telling you to do this morning? Search me, O God.
can't help but wonder how many people now looking back on a situation, maybe, maybe they're looking back on a friendship they had with someone, or it might be they're looking back on a marriage that got torn apart. You know, and now they look back from a different perspective and they, they think to themselves, Oh, if I had only dealt with that bitterness that was in my heart. If I would have just got rid of that, it would have saved my marriage. It would have saved a friendship. But I didn't. Choices have consequences, folks. And I'm telling you, when we make the decision that we're going to sweep it under the rug, we're just going to pretend that we're justified and feeling like we do, you mark it down, you're going to pay a price. It'll be more than you want to pay. I hope it doesn't happen. I really do. Wouldn't it be far better to just get on your face before God and say, Lord, I know I've been needing to deal with this bitterness for maybe years now, and I've just let it go. Or it might have been something that happened just last week, and you're still bitter about it. It might be you need to go to someone this morning and say, I know that you know that I've been bitter toward you. And I want you to know I made it right with God this morning. I've asked God to take all that bitterness out of my heart. Would you forgive me? I don't know what God would have you to do, but I know we're all better off if we do it. Let's sing another verse, Tim.